Good afternoon. We're broadcasting live today from the National Patient Safety Foundation Congress in Austin, Texas at the JW Marriott. We're joined here by over a thousand representatives from hospitals across the country, folks from con continuous quality improvement, risk management, and also finance and the chief executive officer level. I'm joined right now by Stephen Powell from Sinensis. He is the CEO and president of Sinensis. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what they do in the world of patient safety. Steve, welcome, glad to have you here. Thanks, Thank Andrew, you. thanks for having me. It's exciting to be here. You can kind of, if you're hearing some of the noise in the background, it's a, a bustle of really people uh, talking patient safety and quality here in uh, Austin. Great to be here, the weather's fantastic and really good uh, to get a chance to talk to you today. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. So um, tell us a little bit about your role and tell us a little bit about what Sinensis does in the world of patient safety. Well, Sinensis is a training and consulting firm. We also do staffing around patient safety, quality, also really interested in the experience of uh, patient care. And all of these uh, areas we believe are, are, are actually quite connected. And so that if, if you're improving safety, you're also improving quality and, and more than likely you're improving the experience of care that patients, uh, patients have each and every day in hospitals and outpatient facilities. Sure. Um, we're, uh, we've been around for over a decade. Uh, we've been working across uh, um, many different levels of healthcare, either government, uh, civilian, even international. And we're seeing a lot of the same, uh, same patterns in healthcare as far as uh, the improvement that uh, folks are trying to make out there. Right. Um, now your background is kind of interesting because um, you're a pilot. I am. Um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, your pilot experience and how that relates to patient safety. And um, also maybe if you have a chance, comment on your role in um, Team Steps. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, um, I think uh, really the, um, my, my previous life was in the, in the aviation world. And aviation has gone through uh, uh, decades worth of safety management work and uh, trying to improve their safety records. And so I, I've learned a lot over the years uh, from that experience. And before that, I was in the military, also in the aviation side. And thank you many of those, service. thank you, many of those practices are, are still evident today. So what it tells us is that there, um, when you change uh, your practice, in essence, change your culture is what we did sure. over decades worth of work. It was hard work. Um, but when you did that, it's, uh, do that, it's sustainable. Right. And so even uh, today we see the, the safety records of uh, the major airlines, the uh, military aviation still uh, declining uh, in those areas of uh, those serious accident rates and, and driving that safe, uh, safe practice in. Really from that standpoint, uh, they're developed out of that, especially from the time in the Navy working on the aircraft carriers and around that area around high reliability. Uh, thinking and high reliability organizations sure. sort of came out of the research and really thinking about what is some of those safest organizations able to do? What are the traits of those types of organizations? And I guess you've heard probably in the patient safety world that, that buzzword HRO coming up. And, and really about uh, a little over a decade ago, we really started in the program of thinking about HROs from an HRT perspective. And, and you the, might want to just explain yeah. the acronym for so, our audience. So the high reliability organizations really being driven by high reliability teams. Sure. And so, so really the Team Steps program, Strategies and Tools to Enhance Performance and Patient Safety, came out of that, um, that, that uh, HRO perspective. And we, we took evidence from not only aviation, really from nuclear power, and also uh, the military, and even from business practices uh, early in, especially around areas of how to be more effective for, uh, using communication, and also to, to uh, in, in fact, improve the, the coordination of care, if you will. Some of the biggest, riskiest places where we see that uh, being um, used and being applied and to improve care is in the handover or handoff area of care. Sure. So, so it's been very successful. Um, you know, we've trained, I think, uh, and implemented it with over 500 organizations, the Team Steps program across wow. the world, 17 countries. And uh, it really doesn't, teamwork doesn't, and communication doesn't really know any boundaries. So to me, that's really exciting that a lot of what we'll learn to, you know, in the, in the sessions over the next couple days and, and what we've been learning over the last decade are, are really transferable knowledge and skills and abilities that you can uh, not only take from aviation or nuclear power, but really things that we're creating in healthcare over the last decade to improve care. Right. So um, 
the, uh, we're all familiar with the uh, Tear is Human report, which estimated that the number of people um, losing their life in U.S. hospitals annually was 98,000. But the Journal of Patient Safety recently published new numbers, and the estimate is 400,000, which is just incredible. Uh, on top of that, we have 1.5 million people being injured annually due to medication errors, and another 1.7 being injured um, due to uh, hospital-acquired infections. So from your perspective, what is the biggest obstacle to improving patient safety in healthcare today? Well, you know, after being in this work and, and trying to reduce harm in, in really three different industries, this being my third, um, I will tell you from my, my experience and the evidence and the research and the work that we've done in practice, it's, it's really the culture, Andrew. I okay. mean, you know, I, and, and I'll go a little farther so with maybe that. Maybe explain yeah. um, for our audience what culture is. Well, we're talking, you know, we're really talking in, in the area we work in, in safety culture. Sure. And, uh, you know, James Reason kind of, you know, showed us the way a little bit in understanding that there are five, really five parts to culture, safety culture, that is. And that those are a culture that's informed. So it really understands where its harm is sure. and, and how to prevent it. Also, there's um, the culture of reporting culture. Right. And that's that, that's that willingness to report a, a, um, an error if it's, if it's found, and also even near misses, things that don't actually reach the patient, but that uh, could in fact have been uh, led to harm if we hadn't reported it, and keep somebody else from making the same mistake. Right along with reporting really comes in the uh, learning culture, sure. so, so that we don't repeat mistakes and, and, and really try to, in fact, um, Ladies and gentlemen, keep the errors from, uh, from to continuing to occur that are the, our biggest threat. Why don't we just pause while they, uh, yeah. while they announce the beginning of the uh, National Simulation. Patient Safety Congress. The Great. simulation scenario entitled Patient-Centered Care Through Shared Decision-Making in Booth 111 will begin in five minutes. So, so you were commenting. Great, yes. great segue, yes. actually. You Excellent. know, you think about that. Uh, decision making is huge in the, in the world. So I really like the fact that patients are being involved in this. Um, I, I would also add that a just culture is really needed. Um, we find that to be a huge problem. Uh, only about 45% of a uh, large number of surveyed individuals and through the culture safety survey believe that their organization uh, has a just culture. That means that they don't punish when you make a mistake. And you said it right off the start, Andrew, you said to err is human. So human error is inevitable. Uh, with that said, we do believe that there are plenty of uh, safe practices and great tools and strategies that you can apply to actually keep that harm or those errors from reaching a patient and causing harm. Right. And then finally, I, I, would, I would add that um, the, the culture that we were talking about with the team steps that produces is, is called a flexible culture. Sure. This is a culture that's adaptable, it's flexible, but it's also resilient so that it, it's able to, um, to move and to, uh, to adjust when, uh, when things aren't as they seem. So it's during those emergent situations. I'd use the example of uh, in, a, in a situation where you have a low frequency event, say like in obstetrics. Labor and delivery, I was, Absolutely. I was gonna say that. Sure. Um, you know, they may not happen all that, that uh, frequently, but when they do, uh, we want to respond and we want to respond in a safe, orderly, coordinated way as a team if we're going to get that um, baby delivered safely right. and resuscitated well and also uh, that the mom is going to be taken care of in the event of, say, postpartum hemorrhage or something right. of that nature. Nine percent of all births are associated with some adverse event in this country. And again, and it requires teams that are, are trained, practice, and are skilled and use the, the best evidence available to, to deal with those critical events. So, um, so it's, it takes a lot of practice for a team to become that, uh, if you will, instead of a team of experts, becoming that expert team. So practice is a good way to um, my next question, which is how do you think simulation can help? Where do you see simulation's well, role in improving patient safety? Well, I, of, of course, I, I think there's no doubt that, uh, that there are many organizations using simulation to improve on those technical skills. So, um, so, so the idea of uh, my tactile ability to do a task and to do it well and to repeat that over and over again and not, um, in fact, uh, practice on patients, if you right, will, right. But, but practice safely and to also fail safely. 
Uh, so in the technical side, you can see it's very evident. We see that in the schools uh, all, all over the, the country, and we're starting to see that expansion in the, in the international space as well. I think where we're uh, underutilizing simulation is on developing those non-technical skills. Some people call them soft skills, but there's nothing soft about them. Sure. It's, it's, that, it, it's those areas around communication that it, in fact, will in fact uh, cause or, or keep an error for, uh, or a patient safety event from occurring because uh, over 70% of the errors that occur are, are communication errors. And right. when you get to handovers or handoffs, we're talking about 80% of handoffs are usually the result of, inef poor handoffs are the, uh, the result of ineffective communication. Right. And um, so, so I believe I believe it's both. I believe it's sure. the, the ability for simulation to be used to help us improve technical and non-technical skills. If we do that, we're going to get the most bang for our buck from uh, from simulation. I'm always concerned about the adage that practice makes permanent. Yeah. And there's a real opportunity for simulation there to make sure that that the practice is done right and then is permanent. Absolutely. I mean, you know, how many times does it take for us to, to do something over and over and anything in our daily life before we, um, you know, we develop a hardwire that into our behavior? Sure. I talked about a cultural change. Well, the cultural change is that maybe even using simulation in the ways we're talking about may even be a cultural change for some organizations. Right. I, 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 see, I think we have a lot of... Uh, uh, penetration in the in the professional education area, but it's usually with uh, medical professionals working in uh, within among their own profession. Uh, we're just starting to see the interprofessional side of that, where we start to come together and simulate together. That seems more realistic in driving behavior change because we're going to go into a healthcare uh, setting, and, and it's not going to just be a team of nurses or a team of doctors. It's a multidisciplinary team effort. Without naming any organizations, and, and you could uh, certainly draw from your military experience too, have you seen simulation being used for root cause analysis? Oh, absolutely. I, I, uh, we've, we've seen that. Uh, you know, we do a lot of work in the, uh, in the Air Force, so we, we manage the Air Force Patient Safety Program across 73 facilities, and we see that oftentimes if we have a, an event that simulation can be very valuable to recreate the event, uh, to the best that we uh, have learned from our interviews and from our root cause analysis to, uh, to understand really where the system uh, breakdowns could be. Uh, not only the fact that people made a mistake, but is there a system flaw or a process flaw or a protocol that, um, that is, is confusing, if you will. Sure. So uh, it absolutely is, is and, and not only that, it, it, uh, it allows more people to get involved in the root cause analysis. So you bring in nice. the, the professions and Absolutely. you bring in the uh, frontline clinicians to get involved in that, uh, that type of simulated uh, root cause analysis. Exactly, okay. exactly. So what would be your favorite patient safety success story in your past? What, uh, what comes to your mind? Well, really, I, I think two things. Um, I think one has been uh, the uh, first one would be the, the recent, I'm thinking mostly recent things that, that have happened because there are some great things going on. There's some pockets of excellence uh, in improvement that I think are really strong. One is the Partnership for Patients program that we've been sure, involved with for the last few years. We were involved with uh, about five different uh, hospital engagement networks and uh, we saw, uh, we saw dramatic uh, harm reduction across the board. I think as a, as a collaborative, uh, and it, this went across you know, hundreds and hundreds of hospitals in the U.S., we saw the estimates of 40 to 50,000 lives saved over the course of this program, That's reducing uh, hospital-acquired infections, hospital-acquired conditions, and a lot of that was done in concert with develop, uh, implementing evidence-based practice, but also working on those uh, teamwork communication and really cultural changes that needed to be made in the, in, uh, in the systems and in the hospitals. That's making a powerful difference, it really is. The second, the second one really, are, and it really is kind of related to that, was one of those activities, it just happened to be some work that we did together as, with Lairdall, as, as a matter of fact, in uh, the idea of using uh, in obstetrics uh, simulation coupled with uh, the Team Steps uh, tools and the teamwork training uh, areas and then also bringing in the cultural elements. Our focus was really around creating the opportunity for teams to, uh, to debrief in real time after real events, especially some of those critical events we were talking about earlier. And we saw um, dramatic reductions, over 20% reduction in obstetrical harm events 
uh, as a result of uh, that work. And it's also sustaining work. It's been going on now, and those hospitals are able to, to not only have done that for the last three years, but really to sustain that over time. And we continue to apply next levels of simulation so that the, the organizations can build their internal capacity to sure. drive these simulations. And I think one of the neat uh, things that we did in that is that not everybody would have um, you know, all of the mannequins or the resources, because some of these uh, hospitals were, were critical access or um, small rural hospitals. So we used things like the Mama Natalie that was a, a little bit less resource intensive. We even used um, story-based simulations like StoryCare right. to enhance really the, um, the events and, and develop simulations that we could not only be one big simulation, but uh, uh, parse that out and dose simulation over a period of time. Nice. And um, you know, if you just look at that in the states of North Carolina and, South, and Virginia where that occurred, I mean, we're talking about uh, just in that uh, obstetric, maybe hundreds of lives that were, that were saved as a result of that that one program, and if that's um, if that's a, you know your daughter, your sister, um, you know that mom or that baby, you know that grandchild, that child, and and that niece or that nephew, um, uh, brother or sister, very very powerful work. Absolutely, absolutely. That's that really is making an impact. That's incredible. So before we end, um, what words of wisdom would you have for? anyone in our listening audience, hospitals across the country are listening to this right now, what words of wisdom would you have for them? I think, um, I think in this work it's very easy to think about um, the, the healthcare professional and um, the administrators in the hospital, the students, the transition to practice, the healthcare, the, the people who are actually at the bedside doing the work, the staff in the hospital that support them. Uh, you know, I, I think it's it's easy that that's where our focus would be on, you know, and has been for the last decade and will continue to be because it's building uh, skills, knowledge, abilities, attitudes, and, and helping them to actually uh, drive uh, care towards a more reliable system. But I, I, I really would say that um, what I believe is going to be a major, major gain for us in the, in the coming years will be involving patients and families in that care team and in getting them more actively engaged in their own health, their own safety, their own quality of care, and the experience that they expect uh, from, from that care, um, care team. And, and that's only gonna come with a tremendous amount of engagement. And sure. so, so I believe that the things that we're learning as professionals, we're going to have to go one step further and we're really gonna have to start building stronger relationships with our patients and our families so that they trust us enough to get involved get activated and get with us and, and helping us to drive the harm uh, down to zero eventually because none of us are going to be happy till we get it to zero. Exactly, exactly. That's excellent advice. So thank you very much, Steve. Thanks, Andrew. We're going to pause for a moment uh, while we arrange for our next guest to come on board. I hope you come back. I'd love to um, hear you talk about Team Steps. Okay. All and, right. Uh, we could drill down a little bit more on that on the next like uh, to, next session. I'd like to hear you hear you talk about that. Okay. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Steve. It's great talking to you. Welcome, everyone, to Lairdall's booth at the National Patient Safety Foundation Congress 2015 here at the JW Marriott in Austin, Texas. We are surrounded right now by the energy being brought into this hall by over a thousand members representing hospitals from across the country, members of continuous quality improvement, risk management, and those focused on patient safety. With me right now is Stephen Powell, Chief Executive Officer and President of Sinensis. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about Sinensis's work in patient safety. Steve, glad to have you yeah, back. Thanks, we, Andrew. We had you yesterday and it was it was a great talk. It's great, yeah, it's been really exciting getting to see everything that's going on here in the uh, in the Congress. It's really uh, really another big year for, uh, for patient safety and uh, exciting to see what's going on here. Um, it's really a buzz of energy, and, and it's nice to see that, that healthcare is really focused on improving patient safety. Right now, with, with the statistics that have come out, 400,000 people lose their lives annually due to medical error in the United States. And then there's other, other statistics, 1.5 million uh, people being injured due to medication errors, 1.7 million 
uh, acquiring hospital acquired infections. And then in labor and delivery, 9%, 9% of all deliveries are associated with some form of adverse event. So you've got a lot of experience in uh, improving patient safety. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what Sinensis does for those that weren't able to be here yesterday. Talk a little bit about your background and what Sinensis does in sure. improving patient safety. Well, I think I think sort of the segue in that uh, that area would be is that um, it's really thinking about the equivalent for uh, from my background, you know, from being a aviation industry and, and looking at how to develop uh, high reliability systems, sa safety management systems, if you will, to not only um, react to, to errors when they occur, but really prevent them from happening, mitigate, manage those threats that are, are inherent in our systems. And as you kind of stated, um, we've got a long ways to go in healthcare before we're going to have higher reliability systems. I mean, one way that we've seen happen in that and what Sinensis has been involved in probably in the last decade or so is, is really coming up with uh, sort of not only the processes of care that would be safe and, and have, are proven from an evidence-based standpoint, but really how do the people work within those uh, processes? How does the uh, environment impact uh, whether or not you can work safely? How does uh, technology integrate within the, uh, the teams and the, and the people within the organization? And also, finally, the organizational factors, the, the factors of leadership, the factors of, of culture, if you will, within an organization that can either um, enhance a safety system or, or really keep that system from becoming safe. Sure. And that, that would be more of what, what Sinensis is involved in, is looking more holistically at, uh, at a safe system and understanding uh, the human factors that go with it. So, so we know that, uh, that inherently people make mistakes and that human error is inevitable. And so with that kind of thinking in mind is, how do we in fact not let that error um, reach a patient? You mentioned culture, and, and that's an interesting phenomenon in hospitals. Hospitals are a collection of, of typically these very large populations of professionals that are highly trained, highly educated, um, hyper-intelligent in, in so many cases, and yet we have these statistics. And the two just don't seem to, it doesn't match up. Yeah. So talk a little bit about culture and, and how that plays a role in these, these highly educated, highly um, trained environments, and yet still we have these mishaps. So, how does culture affect that? Yeah, so, so let's talk about, let's talk about um, those, those highly trained, highly professional uh, folks. Um, they're, they're, the, the thinking is, is that with anyone who's a highly trained professional is, is that especially in our culture and just our national culture here in the U.S., is that we, we operate um, uh, mostly in an autonomous, individualistic way. Um, thinking about culture. And so if that's the case, it's actually very hard to get us to think differently about how we, in fact, have to adjust to um, bring in other members of the team, other voices. Uh, we have a fairly hierarchical system, so uh, different professions within that uh, body of professionals uh, curry favor or have uh, authority that may be uh, granted to them or they just may be influencers of, of action. And so understanding what to do with that influence, if you're a leader, you can use that for positive and sure. for an improvement side, or it can be used in a way that inhibits uh, communication or inhibits the ability for people to speak up and raise a concern, especially a patient safety concern. So, um, so, I, so I think when you look at culture, I'll give you kind of my short, the short Please. definition is the culture is the norms, beliefs, and values of an organization. Um, secondly, other people would say culture is what we do when no one's watching. And so I think where our disconnect really is, is in culture, if I'm a leader of an organization and trying to look at my culture, especially from a safety perspective, is I want to look at not only what we're saying, but actually what we're doing. And, and that it's that doing part where the rubber meets the road. And that's actually that every time someone touches a patient, there's, there's an action that can either be positive or negative in the system as far as, it, as, far as uh, creating the kind of outcome that you want to create with the patient. So, so it's that sort of thinking that we're gonna have to drive some new behaviors, if you will, sure. as a workforce, as a, uh, as a professional um, group, 
uh, to in fact maybe change some of the ways that we've learned to act, to act differently in a new culture and one that's safe and patient-centric. Now we know that there are some hospitals that totally embrace the idea that they do have a culture and the culture needs to be managed. Um, but in many sectors, it's hard for people to buy into the idea Absolutely. that they have a culture, which always surprises me because we see, especially with high performing organizations, we see that they have a very distinct culture. Um, one that comes to my mind all the time is the U.S. Marines. I mean, that's, sure. that's, that's a high performing, um, high stress environment uh, and organization that, that functions in that environment, and they have a very distinct culture. Um, we see it in, in major corporations that are successful. Apple clearly has a culture. Why do hospitals in many cases have trouble embracing the idea that they have a culture and that that culture needs to be nurtured and managed? But I think, I think it's easy for us to know we have a culture because anyone that walks into a hospital or has worked in different hospitals or different settings in healthcare, uh, can, it's palpable about uh, the, the traits of a culture. So um, it's, 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 it's how do people react to you when something goes wrong, for instance. How, um, how do you inter interface with each other, your interpersonal relationships? And um, how do you also um, treat patients respectfully and with dignity? Are they objects of care or are they in fact the center of care? Are they the quarterback of their care or are they the football um, and getting fumbled uh, That's possibly? So, so the thinking is, is that, that I think it's palpable for anyone who's been in because it's easy to ask a, a physician, a nurse, an administrator, especially when they've been at another facility, how does this facility compare from a cultural perspective to another facility? And just intuitively, they can tell you some, some very key ways that, that, that things are different here. And I, and I think it's in that that, that there's a, a sort of an intuitive nature of this, but I would go farther than that. Uh, the science uh, around culture has progressed in such a way that we can actually measure culture. And then with that, we can um, compare ourselves to like types of organizations, whether it's by size, you know, which is typical uh, around where you, uh, you serve a, a certain size community, or if it's specializing in areas like the operating room or obstetrics or an ICU setting or critical care setting, that, um, that in, in lots of ways the cultures are more similar from facility to facility uh, in the domains than they are generally in the overall culture of the organization. So the other side of this is that, this in, that uh, measurement instruments can help us look at the local cultures that exist right. within our own organization. So there's actually uh, quite a few cultures. Uh, there's the emergency department culture, there's the nursing culture, there's the physician culture. And so I think leaders, honestly, where, I, where a lot of our work comes in is educating senior leaders about not only that, that culture matters, which we're talking about, because honestly, Andrew, um, the, the evidence is overwhelming. Uh, culture impacts patient safety. Sure. Patient safety impacts the patient experience of care and the experience of care directly links to quality outcomes. Exactly. Okay? And so if that's the case, then how do we start pulling all of these things together? A lot of it is education of the leadership. Once they can see the data, uh, for a lot of folks that helps, but also um, one side of our data is qualitative, and it's rich in gold, gold, if you will, for what we hear from the front line about what keeps them awake at night as it relates to safety in their own facilities. And that's something we have to be really keen to listen for. And they'll tell us a lot about whether we're actually doing what we say we want to do around safety and, and the culture here. So uh, yesterday we, we had on uh, Ann Scott uh, Bluen, who is the Vice President of Customer Relations for the Joint Commission. No, I am. And uh, we, we know that the Joint Commission is all over culture. And uh, there are over 4,400 hospitals across the country that have to survey their culture of safety. Uh, it's every two years, correct? Well, it's, it's sort of recommended that that's a, a good recommendation for every two years. We see hospitals uh, measure more frequently or measure elements sooner than that. But that's a good, a good benchmark to think about. And Typically, they're using the um, the HSOP survey, correct? Correct. The, the hospital, hospital survey on patient safety Absolutely. culture. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And that was developed by ARC, and uh, again aligned with a lot of the 
best practices from cultural development work, and this is one of those instruments. So very powerful. Um, it is a, it is part of the leadership standards, and it's also, as probably Ann pointed out, it's part of our. Uh, our, our, our patient safety systems chapter now for Joint Commission accreditation. So uh, it seems as though hospitals are now uh, a little bit more keenly in tune with not only the measurement of culture, but actually the, within the standards of looking at how you're actually improving your culture sure. against that measurement. Now where have you seen um, success in how simulations been used to address culture? So, um, so Simulation is uh, very powerful in moving. I, I think here's one. Of the, let me go back to before I say give you a story on that. Is is this is one of the uh, the barriers for culture change, is that uh, we believe that culture change. Uh, there's a, a a myth, is really what I want to say really to everyone, is that culture change is slow. Okay, so I give you an example. Uh, we were we were running a collaborative with um, uh, with the some of the Lairdall support with our our team. Uh, with the North Carolina Quality Center, great, a great example. And in that, um, there was a coupling of the best practices uh, that, from a clinical standpoint, the technical, the non-technical, the uh, team steps types of school uh, skills and, and strategies and tools, and couple that with um, with simulation. Okay, put those three things together in one package, and then uh, work with teams about developing against some very common uh, critical events. Measure pre uh, pre intervention your culture within right. that unit based context. Set a baseline. Right, and we did that across a number of, of obstetrical um, delivery hospitals. So so over 30 hospitals in that group. So it's a collaborative learning group. We measured the culture. We compared it against that domain specific benchmark for culture. Um, after a year of using these simulation practices and also implementing a debrief protocol following unscheduled C-sections, which was something that these teams were not doing prior to the, um, the implementation of this program. Uh, we found that 10 of 12 of those dimensions significantly uh, improved in a positive direction after only one year. And then That's sustained improvement over year two and year three in 10 of 12 dimensions, some a couple of the dimensions we weren't focused on, some things like just culture, uh, a couple of other little uh, frequency of reporting, which which we increased, but uh, but wasn't directly linked to the thing. But 10 of 12, uh, Andrew, that's very very powerful, and that means, uh, and in some areas, uh, we were getting uh, 15 to 20 percent changes in culture, especially in areas like handovers, right? Because we're working with teams that traditionally have. Um, a lot of challenges in handing off from the delivery of the newborn to the, say, neonatal intensive care nursery as it relates to um, that, that uh, smooth, uh, seamless transition of, of the baby over to another department or even mom going to postpartum uh, or um, off to the floor to recover as well. So, so that's a very powerful way, a, a story of how simulation was a, a powerful, uh, I would call it accelerator for culture change nice. and, and using that. But it, 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 it won't, in and of itself alone, the methodology without the right tools and the strategies combined together to create a real uh, powerful culture change solution. And that's exactly what we did with that, with that particular project. I thought it was bringing all of those uh, facets together at once. So you're, you reduced risk. Yep. You well, we had we had harm reduction. Improved right? outcomes. Yep, absolutely. And change no the culture. Doubt improve patient satisfaction. Exactly. And uh, there's one story from one of the organizations I'll never forget is where we also saw that um, that culture change uh, within just one unit of that hospital uh, that the other units started to look to that unit to help them think about how they could shift their culture. Um, how they could use uh, possibly simulation to help them do that and apply some of these tools and strategies either from you know their perspective which it might be a totally different perspective it might be like inserting a central line in another whole another unit of care but yet when we talked about the team skills that went with it the simulation practice that was part of that and um, and that practice that deliberate practice that went along with it um, they, they saw right away that they became kind of leaders of culture change within their organization. That's great. So it was a lot of spread. So you've probably inspired a lot of people that are listening right now. What words of wisdom would you have 
for a hospital that wants to really laser in on perinatal patient safety and improving outcomes using simulation. You've, so, you've got some lessons learned. Yeah. So, um, so again, you're going to start somewhere, right? And uh, you know, I think, I think what we're learning in this harm reduction uh, area is uh, process is very important. So having good evidence-based practice is going to be essential. And getting all of your providers and your team to agree on on that practice that this is, and be able to hold each other accountable to that that sort of high reliability practice, if you will, that bundle of care that we know works. Sure. The evidence, right? So that'd be number one. Number two is look at your culture, right? Look at the culture of the organization. Look at the culture of that unit of change that you want to make, okay? And and try to look at it in a way, we look at it from uh, what we call the safety culture analytics engine. So we go deep dive uh, across the organization, but also vertical into and those units. that is a service that you offer. Absolutely. And that's available and through Laredoff. Absolutely. And that service is really about uh, trying to under better understand what are, what are we ready to do as far as change in our culture? Uh, what are going to be the things that are going to hold us back from changing that culture? And where can we hone in on two or three specific types of interventions or behaviors, if you will, that would in fact move that culture in a positive direction? And then finally, I would really say that uh, with simulation, you develop some ability to, to um, hardwire some of your system flaws that are out there. We talked a little, we touched on this uh, just for a minute yesterday, which was the, uh, the nature of the proactive risk assessment. That ability to also look at a root cause analysis for those events that you, you have going on. But, but taking those and putting those through simulation and looking at not only um, the, the teamwork behaviors, the outcomes from the technical side, but what are those system glitches that are coming up? And, and quite frankly, if you could get your teams uh, to be the ones that capture those and then re-simulate those in an environment, you can also uh, try to understand how you can make your system safer. That's really the hard wiring. Sure. So that it makes it harder for uh, the human uh, to actually have a mistake that can't be captured before it could actually reach a, a patient. So that would be the, the, the side of it. And I would just tell you, this is something we learned a lot in simulation. I, just one last thought about sure, what I would do in, in, in thinking about this is, is I would say one last thing is that, that it has been kind of an aha for me in simulation. And uh, it was with the Lairdall team, one uh, session we were working together. And I, I asked the question, I said, um, I said uh, can, do people look at the simulator as the patient, as a real patient? Can you suspend disbelief and believe that that simulator, that, that can be a patient? And in actuality, the way that simulation can be done in your organization, uh, there are going to be times where the mannequin's going to be appropriate, but there are other times where different devices allow an alive person to act in that role of a of patient. But in however you apply that, it's, it's the fact that the simulator is the patient. And involvement of the patient, we've seen that in a few of the scenarios uh, this year, which I'm really happy to see, is we have to engage the patient and their family. In an area like obstetrics, it's huge. Of course. Um, so mom and dad both have to be engaged, and, and family as well, because they can be a great safety net for us. I just, um, I just published a new book. It's called The Patient Survival Handbook. Avoid becoming the next victim of a medical error. And I wrote it from the perspective of patients have to come and be involved in our care teams. And to be involved and to be engaged and to be active, they have to be able to ask good questions and they have to be empowered to speak up themselves. And so I would, I would just offer that, you know, really that's kind of a next frontier for us. If we can, we're talking about all the healthcare professionals in this conference. But how are we going to get uh, patients and families also involved? I mean, why can't we um, bring them in and, and be part of the simulation, get some uh, patient family advisory members from our, our board or our council, and bring them in and be uh, participating in these simulations and let them see how uh, we're trying to improve care and make them a part of it? Because they're going to give us great feedback about what is exceptional care through their eyes. Absolutely. That's great wisdom and great, great words of advice. So um, we'd like to have you back this afternoon okay. uh, at 4.15, and we will talk about the Patient great. Safety Handbook. Okay. Um, if our viewers would like to learn more about the Safety Culture Analytics Engine, please go to www.lairdahl.com and search for Safety Culture Debrief right now on our website. 
Um, so we've been uh, joined by Steve Powell, Chief Executive Officer and President of Sinensis. Please wait uh, within the next few minutes. If you just pause, we will be joined by our next guest. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. Welcome to Lairdall's booth at the National Patient Safety Foundation Congress 2015 at the JW Marriott in Austin, Texas. We are joined this week and surrounded by over a thousand members uh, representing hospitals uh, from across the country, uh, staff members from continuous quality improvement, patient safety, also risk management. We're joined right now by Stephen Powell. Stephen Powell is the CEO and president of Sinensis. Thank you for joining us, Steve. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me back. Um, yeah, so you've, you've had a chance to speak a couple times uh, over the past two days, and, and every time has been fantastic. So today, uh, or this afternoon, what we want to do is we want to hear about your new book, The Patient Survival Handbook. And if you could tell us a little bit about that and tell us about how that applies to patient safety. That, that would be wonderful. We'd like awesome. to hear. Awesome. Yeah. I, well, it's a great project. Uh, uh, Co-author, uh, myself, uh, Rick Stone, and, and myself have written this book. It's, um, it's been uh, kind of a, the genesis of it was that, you know, we work um, in this conference and it, it, the, really the focus is on the healthcare professional, uh, the healthcare leadership, administration, and, and on throughout the organization. But there's been very little um, engagement, if you will, or activation of the patient in the patient uh, safety imperative. And so uh, we, we felt like it was time to, to include patients and their families. It seems kind of uh, um, intuitive, really. Sure. But yet, uh, but it's not so easy. And so, uh, so, uh, so really the thought process around this book was to try to pull together what we know about um, engagement and activation, especially in the areas of safety and quality and ask uh, really for patients to, uh, to join us in this effort of improving uh, care. And so uh, that's the, the genesis of the book. And we know that there are some uh, specific things that we can do uh, as healthcare professionals to uh, start that uh, conversation towards building a, a trusted relationship uh, for care, especially when you're in the uh, inpatient setting or you're gonna be in a longer term care facility, trying to understand how that works uh, for a patient and their family is very, very important uh, to their safe care. Now, what, what uh, was there a specific event, specific story, or bit of data that caused you to, to focus in on involving the, the patient in, uh, in patient safety? Well, you know, uh, so, so my, my first uh, um, journey into, into patient safety and into that wor the world of healthcare and the patient safety really came as a result of a, a medical error that my father suffered. Sorry to hear that. And so, so from my perspective, you know, I was kind of a firsthand witness of, of care that that um, that that really lacked uh, coordinated care. So, trying to coordinate care across several uh, specialties or settings or amongst different teams is actually quite uh, complex in the in the healthcare system. And uh, what we s witnessed was that it, the the process or it lack thereof. Uh, really impacted the uh, the safety of his care, and um, and so so that was the first kind of way that I I saw uh, sort of if you will this um, this opportunity to bridge gaps that existed between uh, the healthcare professional and the, and the patient and family. Sure, tell me what uh, the, I'm sure there's all sorts of gems of wisdom and advice in here. Tell us a little bit about what you would uh, recommend to patients to help contribute to a, a safer environment. So I, I think the first part is is that um, this is a two-way street. So uh, so it's just like any relationship that you're building. You know, you have to to first uh, think about that it's important to have a relationship with someone, and then um, you use the same sort of mechanisms that you do in any any relationship building effort. Uh, you, um, you, you try to establish some common uh, ground. Uh, you look at ways that you can um, learn from each other. Uh, you also uh, start to develop trust and um, you have uh, mutual respect for uh, one another. And so uh, even though there can be uh, large knowledge differential in, in the in, from a medical professional to a lay uh, patient or family member, uh, it's really imperative that we understand that patients uh, know a tremendous amount about themselves. Sure. Their medical history is really important to us understanding how to best treat uh, the condition that they present with. 
And so without that, uh, uh, create that ability to create open lines of communication with the patient and their family, um, it's actually quite difficult uh, to, uh, to get to the bottom of, of some situations that are uh, that a patient might present with that, um, that we're trying to better understand how we can best give them care. Uh, so, so in that kind of framework, um, you, we really want to start thinking about how to ask good questions. So instead of having all the answers as a patient, which we won't, neither do our healthcare professionals, uh, which is important to know because the, at the lowest level of activation, if I'm a patient and I'm coming in, uh, if I come into the healthcare setting believing that it's my doctor's job to keep me healthy, um, you're going to be uh, disappointed. Sure. Because uh, the doctor is just one member of a, a much larger, complex healthcare team or setting. Sometimes they're not teams. Uh, they, don't, they don't work real well or coordinate across uh, settings. And some of that is the system perspective, is that it's hard to share information and whatnot. So, so asking questions is very, very key. And so knowing which questions to ask uh, dependent upon the setting, and that's kind of how we shape the book. So if you're in primary care, there may be certain questions that are more suited in that setting. If you're hospitalization, long-term care, nursing home, if you have a loved one in a nursing care, or uh, even if you're into a uh, laboratory or diagnostic setting, that there are risks involved in, in almost everywhere that you receive health care. And understanding how you can, um, if, you will, if you will, manage some of those risky points, it's really important. Right. I'll give you an example. Sure, please. Uh, one is uh, sort of in the area of, of handoffs, or we, we talked about that in the past being a very risky uh, area where the care responsibility for a patient is, is either being uh, shifted from one professional to another. And, um, and what we say in the patient side of things is that if you, you can either be the quarterback, if you use a football analogy, you can be the quarterback, which is mainly be in charge or lead that care, or um, you might end up becoming the football and, um, and getting dropped or fumbled, if you will, right. in that setting. And so knowing that that's a risky time, there's something you can do as a family member is really be present during those shift changes. If you have an advocate uh, that's with you or a member of your family and along with yourself, and, and really just, if you can, if you have the ability to, or your advocate does, taking notes about uh, what's happened in the past 12 hours or eight hours, and what's the plan for the next uh, 12, eight to 12 hour shift. And knowing that when the next uh, nurse comes in or the next doctor, that what they're saying um, coincides with what you've written down as notes. And if they don't match, asking those key questions about, uh, this is what I understood, help me clarify, help me understand. Right. Uh, why things are different, and uh, and it's important to to really make ask those questions, especially when something changes uh, related to what you originally thought was the plan of care. Sure. So, so just asking questions, and that can be on both sides, both the caregiver side and the and the patient family side as well. Excellent. Um, are you seeing um, more and more hospitals doing work with managing, shaping, managing? the patient journey. I've seen a lot of patient journey maps published by hospitals for their staff to help communicate to their staff yeah. what they want the patient experience to be. And that's both a satisfaction experience, but that's also a maximized and optimized outcome well, experience. Well, I, I use this, um, I mean, this is the book, but I, I really like this 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 map post, if you will, sure. for a minute. And, and, it, and it's like there's a lot of, you know, we've seen those signposts and intersections where there's a lot of really confusing directions. Which way do we go, right? And, um, and that, that sort of mapping process is, uh, is so important just when we're going into a store, into a large retail facility, or be able to wayfind. Um, so I, really what you're talking about, Andrew, is, is that you, you need a navigator in the system. And it can be the nurse, it can be the doctor, it can be any staff member, it could even be housekeeping that can help you navigate the sure. system. But it also can be your advocate that's with you during your journey, and they can take some of that literature, help you, you know, if you will, uh, find your way. And uh, I'll get one example, one story that I share is uh, working with a client in the southeast and around this navigating principle, and the idea being that the navigator can also be someone within the hospital, could even be hospital volunteers for that matter. And they can recognize things about your condition uh, that maybe aren't the doctors and the nurses may not even be aware of. 
And so one example was uh, a person, a patient who was receiving chemo. And uh, during that chemotherapy, uh, there was a particularly hot summer, which we have in the Southeast, you know, every year, but this one was really hot. And this individual, learning from, through the navigator and through that, that person that was that advocate, uh, for this uh, individual that that mobile home that they lived in did not have any air conditioning. And not having uh, the right environment for a chemo patient can mean the difference between uh, healing and, um, and really not getting any better after their treatments. And so they, uh, that navigator was able to intervene and through their uh, a, a funding mechanism, able to get that um, patient an air conditioner. So it's not just what happens in the hospital that um, has uh, the healing effect, it's what can, what's possible and practical at home sure. as well. Otherwise patients, one of the problems we, we talk about in this conference is uh, preventable readmissions, which are very costly to hospitals Absolutely. and also uh, add to the pain and suffering of a, of a patient. That would be a place where we would end up seeing that patient back before their next treatment, more than likely as a result of, of something that we could have prevented, in this case it did. So right. uh, uh, another way that, uh, that that patient engagement or activation area and building that relationship gets to the bottom of, of their ability to, uh, to actually follow through with a uh, post-discharge plan of care. Right, and we know that the center, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid have increased their fines this year, their penalties for high readmission rates in certain key areas like sepsis. So it's it's something that a lot of hospitals are are clearly focused on right now. Absolutely, and and I, I I think what you know we can we can look at you know everything we can do, but the idea is the more you can can look at building relationships, With building patient, trust, sure. you've got a better chance of compliance after the uh, after the discharge, and we've seen through some of our efforts that. Um, that, that in that discharge it's more than just a checklist. Right. It, it's actually a little coaching. So the idea of things that we use in the teamwork area around checkbacks or readbacks, right? Um, and with patients it might be a teachback. So I've, I've given you some uh, medical instructions or care instructions. T teach it back to me about how you're gonna take care of this wound or the family member. How are you gonna know if, if uh, this particular uh, suturing if, if we uh, have a complication mm -hmm. that you'll be able to recognize that and be able to uh, call us and, and alert us as to uh, a need to maybe revisit uh, the, the physician or, or the nurse that's taking care of your, uh, your case. Sure. You, you landed on, I think, a, a very key area uh, and um, it happens to be patient discharge. All this wonderful care goes into improving the patient's health and then at discharge, that final uh, final inspection station, as it were, quality inspection station, before the patient's released, so much can happen right there. If if a patient doesn't understand their medication instructions, uh, doesn't understand the severity of their case, doesn't understand necessarily even things as simple as diet and, yep, and rest sure. and so forth. Well, can really make the difference between a successful recovery and possibly a readmission. And that's, that goes back to uh, what we talked about, about a handover. Now the handover, instead of to another healthcare professional, is actually to maybe a family member sure. who's going to be responsible or an advocate that's going to be responsible to help that patient get better. And uh, that's a, a you can see the, the likelihood of a fumble there in that uh, setting. So it's a, it's a weak area that we feel like, you know, that with some education on the patient's side, and with some activation on the standpoint of owning some of that responsibility and maybe change of behavior or continue to, um, uh, to monitor their uh, blood pressure or vitals or whatever the case may be, or, or even stopping smoking if it's related to a, a lung disorder or you know, a respiratory problem, and knowing that I can still do that when I get home sure. outside, the that's really, really important. And, and it also shows some of the weaknesses in our care coordination areas. So, so that even if you're being discharged to a, a rehab or wound care uh, management, uh, are we really talking to each other? And do we really understand, again, what the uh, long-term goal is for this particular patient, their situation, their unique situation for what, what sort of resources do they have to help them get better? And again, uh, what might be some areas they are gonna be most threatening to that patient based on maybe an allergy or some, some other condition that we're not uh, aware of because we haven't ask those questions, those proper questions in, in that situation. Have you seen um, simulation used at all in 
improving oh, yeah. how people interact with I mean, I was, and, we were just at the, yet last week we were at the Sun Conference in Atlanta, sure. and I, I attended one of the uh, sessions on home health. And so with the, uh, uh, the team that's looking at how do we do simulations around helping, uh, imagine this. So here we go, we got a simulation in the home with the advocate or the family member around a pediatric um, a need to, to maintain the health of the, of the pediatric patient in the home. So this will be mom and dad, you know, usually, or a sibling or, you know, a relative. And um, simulation in that is to most a lot of these problems are airway problems, right? Sure. And so you have a compromised airway. So how do we do a simulation to help that um, that loved one react to a situation where the airway becomes um, compromised? And and what kind of actions would we take? And uh, some of that, you know, is uh, immediately we can call 911, we can ask for help, but there could be other things that keep us from having to call that emergency responder if we know as, as a family member how to respond to that, that, that situation. And it could be that we can manage that ourselves. And, the, and we're being asked to do that more and more in the whole Ladies home health setting. Sure. So, um, so they're doing, uh, hospitals are doing simulation to train families in how to do this care before well, it, they take, Mostly take the, the this would be more of a, the home health, uh, the home health centers that are responsible for, okay. are doing training. Very good. And, uh, because they, the patient and the family in that setting are way more important in the, because remember your, maybe your home health nurse only comes by you know, uh, once or twice a week, right? And there are other people that come and provide assistance. Maybe it's even the um, the vendors who bring, you know, oxygen or other uh, supplies to the home. But uh, but knowing as a, I, I'm now becoming more and more uh, responsible as a parent in that situation or a, a family member, if I have an elder parent or somebody that I'm taking care of in the home, uh, to, to be able to manage a situation that becomes difficult. So they have their couple of critical events that in those settings where you have to be very responsive and using simulation to practice that is gonna make you feel more confident and even competent to manage that, that situation. Brilliant, brilliant. So. Um, tell us where, uh, and I'd like you to please hold the book up to the camera. Um, tell us where people can find the book. Well, probably like where everybody finds books these days, Amazon. Okay. So just just take a look at the the patient survival handbook. Uh, happy to do that. One good thing I want people to know, you know, this is a this is a tool where we're really looking at um, it being used when you need it. So it's a just in time book. So there'll be there's e copies too. You can put on your smart devices or on your iPads. And that the um, the thinking too is here, Andrew, is that all of the um, the proceeds from this book are, are we're going to put right back into uh, the patient advocacy uh, group campaigns that we're familiar with that are doing a great job of, of advocating on that behalf of patients around patient safety and uh, quality of care. So we're we're really excited about uh, about this this project and, and the impact that it, it could have in in drawing in uh, new team members on the team. Because I don't think it's like you've you've seen before. Have you ever gone to a, a healthcare facility that isn't understaffed? Right. Of right. Course. Nobody talks about they've got too many staff. Too many people. But right. we've got we've got eye we've got eyes and ears in the family and the patient that can help us sure. become witnesses of their them. care and engage them. So. Exactly. Well, thank so you very much, that. Steve. So the book is the Patient Survival Handbook by Stephen Powell uh, and by Rick Stone. You can find it on Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. And Steve, thank you very, thank you very much for joining us. We we really do appreciate it. You've you've been with us now four times, and every time has been a great experience. Thank so, you, Andrew. It's great to you, great to talk to you on this topic. Really Thanks appreciate it. That's all for now from Lairdall's booth at the National Patient Safety Foundation Congress 2015. Please join us in a few minutes for our next speaker. Thank you.